Morning. Morning. It's great to see you all. Warm welcome to you. Visit us today. It's a privilege for us to have you with us. And we're here to worship the living God. Give thanks to him, praise him for who he is. And if you don't know him and you're here today, then we hope that you will have a taste of what it's like to watch people who love and are known by the God who's created this universe. And we pray that you would hear from heaven today as well, and that you would meet with Jesus. Let's, uh, let's pray before we turn to God's word. Father, we come before you this morning and we give you thanks. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, that we have woken up this morning to this beautiful sunshine, this countryside, the birds singing. Lord, we are so privileged. We're so privileged to live in this county. We are so privileged, most of all, to be known by you. And Lord, as we quiet in our hearts, ready to meet with you this morning, we pray that you would help us, Holy Spirit, to remove everything in us that does not belong, any thoughts that are worldly, any sin that we're still unrepentant of, Lord, I pray that you would deal with that now, right now. Thank you, Father, that there is always time to come to you and bring our sin before you. Thank you, Father, that by your Spirit you will remind us of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name and ask that he would be glorified this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's read Psalm 20. And then we'll go through some, some brief announcements. Psalm 20 says this, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favour your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfil all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation, and in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the King. May He answer us when we call. And we're going to stand and sing our first hymn. Now, before we do our announcements, let's stand and sing together. Because this is um, as some teenagers in my old church used to say, "This is a banger." <laughs> So, uh, for us older ones, we might not refer to it in that way, but it's uh, absolutely glorious. Let's so stand together and sing how great that uh, <laughs> Oh, 
couple of quick announcements uh, for us this morning. If you haven't seen already, there's some rotors and sign-up lists at the back uh, that have come in and follow. Uh, so tea and coffee rotors, there'll be a welcoming rotor shortly as well. There's home groups uh, to sign up for. If you are willing to post on a home group, then just put a little H in brackets after your name. That would be much appreciated just so when I'm planning it, because we're hoping to start all of this um, in September, at some point in September. Uh, so that would be really helpful for me. Uh, so thank you if you've done that already. Um, just to announce for those of you that know Joe and Irina Whitfield. So Joe works for Checkpoint, goes around doing all the assemblies in schools in Herefordshire. Uh, so they have a little girl. Uh, Two days ago? Wednesday, Wednesday morning. Uh, so Evie May and uh, all of Joe's farming, lambing experience came in handy because he delivered his daughter himself in, in the bathroom and then uh, our tenants arrived shortly afterwards. So uh, we can be praying for Joe and Irina and uh, Evie May. That'd be much appreciated. I don't have any other announcements, but uh, if anyone else does, now is the time. Okay. No? Fantastic. Okay, I will hand you over to Kay. So Kay's going to come and let us know about a book that's recently hit the shelves. I won't say any more, John, otherwise I'm going to make a silly joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'll regret it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
again because um, it's really relevant to me. And that one was the reading for the 5th of August. And it says, seeing only him, that's the kind of Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, verse 2. And the recommended reading came from John. And John Roberts, this is, this time, started with a very personal story. And then he went on to ask a question. He said, why do we keep persevering in the Christian life when the race can be so difficult and demanding? And then he answers it. It is the thought of one day casting our eyes upon Jesus and looking into his wonderful thoughts. And how true that is. And then he goes on to say, so when the battle becomes tough and the journey weary, turn your thoughts towards Jesus and keep focused upon him. He will inspire you to continue until your journey has come to its end. So very, very true. And I think for everyone that has had gone through this very difficult year, you can absolutely agree with those sentiments. And so John, we are so grateful and grateful to day one for putting this into the book that we can all keep by our bedsides. And thank you to John and day one because although the book Retails at £15. We have been given a discount <laughs> and you can buy it for 10 And there are some sheets at the, as you come in to the chapel, and you can sign up if you'd like a copy for yourself. And you will have those delivered sometime over the next week or so. And so, you know, I just, I just wanted to endorse it and say, John, it really was a blessing to me. And I know that our lovely cat, if she was here today, she would be so thrilled to have her copy of that. Because she used to tell me when we spoke on the phone just how much that particular thought for the day meant to her. And so, yeah, it's, it's a terrific book and it's been a terrific help. And can I just sideline for a moment? Can I also just say thank you to all who prayed for me? And can I just tell you that your prayers are answered, and God truly was with me when I went through my surgery. So much that I'm only going to bore you with one detail, but just to prove that God's peace was really upon me, which I know you pray for. My blood pressure, and this is before the use of this got involved, okay, was 110 over 75. So if that doesn't demonstrate that God was holding me in his hand. I don't know what does. And so I want to thank you all. Thank you, church, for being so faithful. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. So if you would like a copy of the book, £10. So I'm not sure what they say about Yorkshire people being tight. There's a deal to be asked. Technically, it's worth absolutely and all jokes aside, I mean every word that I wrote in the endorsement at the beginning of that book it was an absolute blessing. And um, it was a joy to have people sending emails and phone and text messages saying, Oh, this is fantastic. Please, can I sign up my friend? Or can I, where do I send the email addresses for more people to be added? So, um, thank you. Okay, let's um, have our next song, which is a children's song. So we're going to sing this one together, children. And this will help you, I hope, before you go into Sunday school, because today I believe you are going to be looking at one of my favourite stories in the Bible. So I have to really control myself. I'm not getting excited and talking about this passage, but it's about Jesus calming the storm. So we're going to sing Christ in the vessel. Yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. 
And if you'd like to turn your Bibles to John chapter 17, we're going to be looking at verses 6 to 19 this morning. And we're going to consider two, probably the most difficult topics, uh, not just for unbelievers, but also for believers as well. John 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be but now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Let's pray. Lord, you know that I need your help to preach on these difficult topics. Lord, I thank you for the blessing of being able to preach exegetically through different books of Scripture. And Lord, that hopefully means that we cover the whole counsel of God, and, and it means that we can't just avoid the difficulty. Lord, please speak to us, please help us, guide us and comfort us with the parts that are difficult for us to stomach. Help us, Lord, to remember that you are truly good. You are greater, you are beyond what we even know is good. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look at two things this morning. Firstly, what's mine is yours. And then secondly, being protected in Jesus' name. Last week, uh, we looked at a little bit of verse 2. And, and this, this word to give, to give or given, is repeated quite a lot in John's Gospel and especially in this chapter. So in verse 2, Jesus was talking about the people that, that had been given to him. People are giving to the Son. Jesus was given work to do. He was given the people. Jesus gives eternal life to those people. And we get it three more times in this section that we're looking at this morning. So given or gave 
If in verse 6, you see that twice, the people you gave me from the world. And then it says, you gave them to me. And then in verse 9, those you have given me. Just a brief technical explanation. It's in the perfect tense, so it means that it's a past action, but it, it's effective now, in the present. We won't go into any more than that for now. But the results continue. In the past, the Father gave Jesus a people. We call those people the church. The church of the big capital C, the global church. This is a local church, little c. God chose people, but he didn't choose people based on, on merit, on ability, on race, on ethnicity, on finance, on any ability at all. And he did this in eternity past, before he created the world. So the Apostle Paul writes to the Ephesians that you were chosen in Christ before all the foundation of the world. So God is not thinking off the cuff. He's got a plan. He's had a plan for a very, very long time. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 says, We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning. For salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. He's encouraging the Thessalonian church, I mean, the Thessalonica, to you need to be thankful to God, you need to be praising Him, you've been chosen. Revelation 17 The Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those who are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Last action, perfect result that continues in the present. You get a lot of this in John's Gospel. I know we've covered much of this. If you've been with us from the beginning in the last couple of years, then you know back in chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. It's impossible for us as dead sinners who are born Sinful. For us to, to muster up the motivation to love God. We hate Him. When we're born into this world, we're His enemy. We're at enmity with God. And if the Father draws us, draws us to Jesus, then suddenly things start to change in our hearts and in our minds. Jesus said in, in just a couple of chapters previously, in John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That's what he said to the disciples. And that, that was the opposite for how it was. Normally a disciple would choose a rabbi and say, oh, I'd really like to follow you, learn your ways. But Jesus went out and he chose the disciples. Completely the opposite. But this doesn't mean that the disciples were some passive robots. It doesn't mean that we are passive robots when we, when we feel the call of God, when we hear him call us, when the Father draws us to Jesus. It's not just an automatic response. We're not passive in that. God's people respond to his call. He reveals his glory. We react to that glory. We receive something of that glory. He puts that in us. So God takes the initiative, but as Jesus says in verse 6, they have obeyed your word. So there's the human responsibility. There's the decision that the disciples make to obey God. They chose to obey Him. It's a bit like if you think about if you'd asked one of the younger children when they came in this morning, so little old Heidi, for example, what was she about, 18 months here, something like that, and if you said to Heidi, I'm oh, okay, look, you must have had your plaits, did you, did you do your hair this morning? She would say, yeah, she might just nod her head or something, very quiet. 
You might say, oh, did you have breakfast? I see a little corn flake on the side of the chin still or something. Did you have breakfast? Yeah, yeah, I have breakfast. I'm off my head. Did you get dressed? Oh, I like your outfit, you look really smart. Yes. And that's true. She did have a breakfast. She did have her hair done. She did get dressed. But I'm pretty sure it was her mum or dad, or both, that washed her hair in the bath, that, that brushed her hair, that got her dressed, that made her breakfast, maybe even fed her. So it is true that she got up, got dressed, did her hair, had breakfast, but, but who did most of the work? David and Natasha. Not Heidi. Heidi responded to what her parents were doing. And sometimes she might do that in obedience. Sometimes <laughs> it might be a bit more difficult, kicking and screaming. That's kind of like how it works with the call of God. The disciples kept the word, but who gave them the word? God. The disciples believed in Jesus, but who sent Jesus? God. The disciples had faith, saving faith. But faith is a gift from God. And if the Father, as Jesus says, that, that they belong to the Father, and the Father's given them to the Son, so if that's true, which I believe it is, then his people, the church, must have belonged to the Father first. And the Father gives them to the Son. Now, I don't think that means that he's saying the disciples were saved, God-fearing Israelites before they met with Jesus. We don't know about their religious state before they met with Jesus. But what we do know is nobody in the history of the universe has ever come to the Father apart from through the Son. Jesus didn't turn up and, said, and say, I am now the way, the truth and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody has ever come to the Father unless through me. So Old Testament Christians, Old Testament saints, were saved by faith in the Messiah to come. New Testament, us lot, are saved by faith in the Messiah who has come. History revolves around the Lord Jesus Christ and him coming to this earth. I think that what this means is the Father had predestined them to be his children before they even met with Jesus. And that kind of blows our mind a little bit. And you might have had this feeling yourself, I know I did. When you become a Christian, and if it was like me later on in life, 29 years old, and what blew my mind as I looked back upon those 29 years and thought, hang on, all those years when I was rejecting God, when I was even using his name as a swear word, when I was living in opposition to him, when I was hating him, he was loving me. He was making plans and preparations and, and paving a way for me. It's a bit much. I need to get my head right. I need to comprehend and accept that level of love. It's quite easy to love people who are loving us, isn't it? When Jesus says to us, you know, we're talking about love your church family and love your family at home, we find that sometimes it's challenging, but on the whole, it's much easier to love a person like that. But when he says love your enemies, love those who hate you, love those who are trying to kill you, well, that's a challenge. But we see that in the person of Jesus. We see that from the Father, how he was loving us when we were hating him. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The disciples belong to God. Jesus is making that really clear in his prayer here. He's prayed for himself in those first five verses we looked at last week, and now he's praying for the disciples. And he's reminding them that nobody's been lost. Nobody was 
lost, except Judas, who's always been spiritually lost. He was there physically, but spiritually, he was never there. Never ever. Jesus said in John 13, 18, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. Jesus knew what was going on all along. He might have looked very helpful, like the ultimate deacon, church secretary, looking after the money, caring for the poor. He said and did all the right things superficially, but inside, his soul didn't change. He never had saving faith. John 6, 39, This is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Jesus knows who are genuinely his, the real church. He knows. And he says, those, I'm losing none of them. None. Once you're in, you're in. You're safe. You're shielded. You're protected. Many, many Christians over the years have said the same thing. If we could walk away and lose our salvation, we would. Every single one. We would. So we're saved by the power of God, but we're also kept, we're also sustained by the power of God. We keep his word, and he keeps us. He sends the word, we follow the word. God is faithful, and he asks us to be faithful too. And one of the main things that the disciples need, needed to understand was that Jesus was sent by God. They needed to get their heads around that. Because nobody denied Jesus. This is something that you need to bear in mind when you have a conversation with unbelievers. But there's no arguing with the fact that a man called Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. It's ingrained so permanently in history. You'd be a fool to argue that fact. There's just too much evidence. Even his enemies didn't deny the miracles that he did. Not once do we read in history or in the Bible of the people who hated Jesus saying, oh, he didn't do it. He didn't actually do that. He didn't heal that boy. He didn't raise that man dead guy. They all acknowledged that he did those things, but what, what they did to satisfy themselves in their unbelief is they said, you do what you do by the power of yours. So you're sent from the devil. That's why you can do this stuff. Whereas the disciples, saving faith is recognizing that Jesus is sent by God, that he is God, that he lived a life that we should live but can't and haven't, and he died a sacrificial death on the cross to make atonement for our sin. And that he rose on the third day in victory. And he ascended back to the Father. And he sent his spirit to live in each and every believer. To unite Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and Church as one family. A family that will spend eternity together. Saving faith. And the disciples, they have these people... With Jesus, listening to him pray to the Father, they have saving faith. Edward Carnell once wrote, Faith is the resting of the mind in the sufficiency of the evidence. The resting of the mind in the sufficiency of the evidence. The reason we remain in our faith is we remain in Christ. And with branches, and we're attached to the vine. We stay connected to the vine, and we remain in him. Connected to Jesus means not only that we're connected in, in his death, that his death is effective for us, but it also means that his prayers are effective for us too. Have a look at verse 9 again. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. The world hates the fact that God favours his people. 
And I know that to be true because three days ago I had a conversation with an unbeliever who was absolutely fuming at this truth. He said, God treats everybody equally. I said, hang on, you don't even believe in God. Well, if there was a God, he should treat everybody equally. That's what he should do. And don't we hear that quite a lot? A lot of people, people who know God, people who don't know God, telling us what God should do, how God should work. And we forget that he is completely and utterly above and beyond us. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Even now, as saved Christians, with the Holy Spirit living in us, our mind and our heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. We cannot always trust ourselves. We can only trust him. Can we never lose sight of the privilege of knowing Jesus. And verse 10 should wow us every time we read it. All mine are yours. All yours are mine. Or you can also translate this. Um, everything that you have is mine, essentially. So what Jesus is saying is everything that belongs to the Father also belongs to him. That's quite a statement. This is where C.S. Lewis uh, writes about, you can't deny Jesus, you can't deny he existed, but you've got to make a decision. Either he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Either he completely lied about everything, he's a complete and utter crazy guy, or he is God. Because statements like that, what are you going to do with that? Everything belongs to Jesus. Everything belongs to God, we, we all believe that. And Jesus said, yeah, that's all mine too. It's quite a claim, isn't it? Massive claim. The sun is the image of the invisible God, first born over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. If you're a Christian, that's the one who's praying to the Father for you. The one who owns everything. He's not limited in his resources. He has everything. He has access to everything. If this doesn't encourage us in our prayers, I don't know what will. If this doesn't encourage us and motivate us to pray big prayers, bold prayers, it should Praise for us. And this is the one who sends the apostles into the world. Apostles mean sent ones. So like Jesus was sent from the Father, Jesus is now sending the apostles into the world. They're set apart from the world, but they're still set, sent into it. So they're different, but they're going into the world. They're not to be a bunch of, of monks or nuns that live completely isolated and separate from the world. Because Jesus is praying that his disciples remain solid in truth, but also faithful to mission. He sent them on a mission to the world. And then sometimes as Christians we can get these conflicting motivations. We want to remain true to God's word, faithful to the truth. But we know that the world tempts us. And when the flesh and the world and the devil, and they get together, we know that's too much for us. And so we try and shield ourselves from that. And we want to just buy a house in the middle of nowhere with loads of land around us and have our own little Christian community. And, and we just want to protect ourselves from all temptation. And I think our motivations are good in that. But the problem is, although we're faithful to the word, we're unfaithful to the mission. Now, on the other hand, we can get so motivated by mission, we're pushing mission, mission, mission all the time. Let's, let's go in the pubs, let's do this. Let's go and meet with the unbelievers. Let's, let's hit the streets. Let's do this, let's do that. And sometimes we're not faithful to the word. We lose our way a little bit. We lessen our standards. And we get affected by the world rather than affecting the world. And so we have to hold these things in tension. 
there's a, a term in football, if a team is, is losing or they need to win, usually the last five minutes, one of the coaches will just shout from the sideline, just get in the mixer! And that basically means just poof it up there. Just get as many bodies as you can near to the goal and just pummel it into the box. So all of the stuff that you've worked on in training, for all those hours, patterns of play, tactics, that player's going to move there, you go around there, and then we're going to get it wide across it. All that just comes out the window, just forget all that. Just get it in there. Our mission is goal, score. And you just go back to basics. It's like going to local league football when it gets to that point. Hoof it up there, it's in the goal. Done. Easy. Something thing is, it rarely happens. And we can't do this as Christians. We don't need to panic. We keep to the pattern of play that Jesus has taught us. We don't just throw ourselves in the mixer and abandon everything that we've learned. We remain wise, but we also remain with this passion for the loss, passion for mission and truth, but refusing to compromise on either of those things. We keep both. We live differently to the world, but we are certainly in the world. The Father sent the Son into the world, the Son is now sending the disciples into the world. The Father said and did what he saw and heard his Father doing. The disciples now are to do and say what they hear Jesus do. It's a pattern. So that's our first point. These disciples have been chosen, they have been selected, and they've also been selected for a very particular mission. We're going to carry out that mission when Jesus leaves. Our second point this morning is being protected in Jesus' name. On Sunday evening, Richard uh, went through Genesis 15.1 with us, uh, which says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. And we talked quite a lot about God being our shield and our protector. And I had to try really hard not to, to say very much uh, because of this morning. What does God shield us from? <coughs> this week, you would have heard in the news about uh, Afghan Christians who are about to be killed, missionaries, because they're going to be sentenced essentially to death. The crime of being a missionary. You may have read about uh, Iraq, Christians in Iraq, who will be beheaded if they haven't been away. You may read the news, you may you know, read things that you get sent through from Open Doors and other organisations, and you just think to yourself, hang on, where, where was God? Where, where was the shield? Where was God when, when Jim Elliot went to witness to the Barani people in Ecuador, people he'd been praying for, people he loved. Where was God when he speared into death? Where was his shield? He died, he, he was killed, murdered. Where was, where was Jim's shield? And we read about good, faithful Christians in pain and dying all the time. Now, this is one of the most common struggles of Christians and non-believers as well. Really good book, C.S. Lewis again, Problem with Pain. Fantastic book. For those of you who like the Avengers, probably nobody above 50, <laughs> the Avengers is kind of set up to protect the world. It's all fantasy, it's not real, but stay with me for a moment. There's a lot of youth talks on <laughs> Avengers. The Avengers is set up, but, but there's an organisation that's set up to protect people from attacks within the world and also from without as well, outside of the world. And that organisation is called S.H.I.E.L.D. But S.H.I.E.L.D. didn't always succeed. And a lot of the time, good people get hurt and die. 
And it just makes you angry, even watching the film, knowing it's not real. It's all fantasy, it's made up. It makes you angry. That person was to die, he was a goodie. He died, he was killed, he was hurt. Where was S.H.I.E.L.D.? He failed. Jesus doesn't pray that the disciples won't be persecuted. He doesn't pray for them to be loved by the world. I don't know about you, but I pray for that quite a lot. Jesus doesn't. He doesn't pray for persecution not to happen at all. 1 John 5 verse 18 says, We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now, when Jesus walked this earth, he was fully man, fully God, and he was with the disciples, we do see the truth that he is the shield. We considered this a few weeks ago. Every attack, every bit of abuse, even if it was directed at the disciples, Jesus protected them from it. He stood at the front. He was their shield. None of them were harmed. They wanted to throw Jesus off cliffs. They wanted to stone Jesus to death. They wanted to hang Jesus on a cross. So the whole time he is physically there, he is their shield. No harm comes to any of them. It's incredible. He shields them. None of the devil's flaming arrows penetrate them. It's a shield. But he's told them he's about to leave. The shield is going back to heaven, back to be with the Father. While in the world, Jesus says, you're going to have trouble. Let's read verse 11 and 12 again, just to think about the name of God. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, the scripture might be fulfilled. Psalm 20, that we read at the start of the service this morning, may the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 54 says a similar thing, O oh God, save me by your name. Many of the Jews refused to use the name of God. God was, was other, he was, he was beyond, he was distant even. We never dare use the name of God. Only once a year, the high priest going into the Holy of Holies would ever dare to say the name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah, Lord. The rest of the time, forget it. And that day was the Day of Atonement as well, a very special day. Yet through his son, God is close. He's close right now to the disciples. They're sat next to him. It's within touching distance. Cast your mind back to Exodus 3 when the Lord appeared to Moses and revealed his name. I am. I am who I am. I have been who I have always been. I will be who I will be. And yet we get to John's Gospel, all throughout John's Gospel. Jesus not only uses the name of God, refers to God by name, but he himself is the great I am. I am the bread of life. I am the gift. I am the good shepherd. He's the great I am. He's the image of the invisible God. He's the words of God the Father. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. And he reveals the full character of God as part of what's included in this description of his name. So in Jesus, we know that we're safe. 
but not from the world. There is no promise that we are safe from the world. What are we safe from? What are we shielded from? The answer is God. The scariest thing is not the world. The most powerful and potentially scary thing is God himself. When God speaks to Christians about the Bible, the most common command is do not be afraid. And it's always spoken directly to a believer. Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of the world. Don't be afraid of these circumstances. Do not be afraid of God. Because you know him. You're known by him. You're a friend. You're in the family. You have nothing to fear. So when, when David is praying, you are my strength and my shield, I think he, he is thinking about his Messiah. He is thinking that I am not going to receive what I deserve for my sin. In Jesus, we are shielded from the punishment that we deserve. When we committed our very first sin, God had every right to end our life right then and there. Immediately. But in his mercy, he, he chose to, to keep us alive. And when we do die, each and every one of us will stand before it. And if you don't know Jesus, he will not be your shield on that day. And if your Father is not our Father in heaven, God the Father, then your Father at the moment is Satan. But he will not defend you on that day either. He will not argue your case. He has no favour with God. You will stand and you will stand alone before a holy God. And it will be absolutely perfect. You don't, you don't need to, because those in Christ will stand on that day and they will be shielded by Christ, by his righteousness, by his blood, by his perfection. You will be hidden in him, and you'll be saved, because you know that, that God's righteous anger and punishment for your sin, well, that was dealt with at the cross. Done. Remember a little while ago we talked about the, the tense, the perfect tense, to give God's, God's message, his preservation of his own continues forever, it's a continuous thing. Well, when Jesus describes the world's hatred, it's, it's in a different tense. It, it, it ends. It doesn't continue on into the future. It has a, an end bit. Very subtle little thing, but very important for us to remember as Christians. This, this suffering that you're maybe going through now, our brothers and sisters are going through, one day it's going to end. It's temporary. It's a fleeting moment. But being part of the family of God, being shielded by Jesus, that, that remains forever. John, James 4.4 4 says, Friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. If we take our stand with God, we must be prepared to face the anger and the wrath of a godless society. You have to be ready for that. But if you take your stand with the world, you have to be ready to face the righteous anger and wrath of the holy God. And you will never be ready for that. The only way to be ready for that day is to trust in the Lord Jesus, claim him as your shield. Jesus has taken his people out of the world in a spiritual sense, so our place in eternity is settled, it's done, we're not of the world anymore, but for now but we're in it. And sometimes we can even get a bit lost in it. And he needs to rescue us from something in the world again. And if that's you, and you know you're a little bit lost in the world at the moment, you can pray. You can pray to Jesus, you can pray to the Father, and the power of the Spirit, and you can ask him, Lord, please rescue me. I'm a bit lost in the world at the moment. This is not my home. 
I'm just here for a little bit. I know where I'm going. I'm following Jesus. I'm coming back to you. Can you just rescue me from this? There's a big difference between, just to finish, big difference between being rooted in our faith and being stable in who we are and who God has made us to be. Look at the difference between Peter and Judas. Judas fell never to rise again. Peter fell, but he was raised up. Why? Well, he had genuine saving faith. There's another reason why. Jesus told him that that's exactly what he would do. You will fall, you will deny me three times, but I have prayed for you at the time. Jesus prays for his own. Praise be. He ever lives to intercede for his people. And he does that because he loves you. Because he died for you. And you will spend forever with him in glory. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing the cornerstone. Lord, we know that we have won the crown. But for a short time, we know also that we must carry the cross. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to get our head around these, these difficult truths. Lord, it's, it's glorious that we have been chosen in Christ. Lord, it's incredible that you were thinking about us before even creating this world. Lord, but we do struggle with these things. We struggle when we think about those who don't know you. We struggle when we go through suffering. We struggle when we see people we love suffer. We even struggle when we see people we don't even know suffer. But Lord, help us not to get frustrated with you, not to be angry with you or to question you, but to pray to you. To join Jesus in speaking to our Heavenly Father. Lord, help us continue to teach us how to pray. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.
Jesus, that you are Lord of all, that you hold the world in your mighty hands, and you have the power and control over all things, that nothing catches you by surprise, nothing is beyond your ability to intervene and to take hold of, and Lord, we just pray that we would have that level of faith, that we trust you every day, that we wouldn't doubt and waver and struggle, Lord, that we would just throw ourselves before you, that we would pray and say, Lord, please increase my faith. Yeah. Lord, please guide us and help us this week. We love you and we praise you. And we ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, our shield, Jesus. <laughs>